Welcome to this week's edition of This Week in Civil Engineering, also known as TWICE, a weekly news show focused on providing civil engineering professionals with the most important and relevant industry updates. I'm your host for this episode, Luis Duque. I'm a practical civil engineer working as a bridge engineer in Boulder, Colorado at Full Hills Bridge Company. I work in dismantling and erection and retrofitting of bridges and everything related to temporary structures around bridges. I am also the founder of Engineering Our Future, where I share my experiences as a young engineer to help other engineers and students succeed in their careers. You can find all the episodes of This Week in Civil Engineering at twice.news. That's twice, T-W-I-C-E dot news. Reference to all these news stories covered will be in the episode show notes. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the Civil Engineering News playlist to receive weekly updates. Now it's time for what's happening this week in civil engineering. Now it's time for this week's news. You are about to hear excerpts from the story's reference. Links to all the full articles can be found at twice.news. First, let's cover the biggest breaking news from this past week that may affect civil engineering companies and professionals. Firstly, alternative materials could shrink concrete giant carbon footprint from Mitchell Jacoby, CEN.ACS.org. Concrete accounts for roughly 8% of the world's anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions and consumes 2 to 3% of the global energy supply, according to the International Energy Agency. Global per capita consumption of cement has nearly tripled in the past 40 years. Cement manufacturers have steadily improved the energy efficiency of the enormous kilns used for heating and processing the starting material for which cement is made. Boosting energy efficiency reduces fuel consumption, which lowers carbon dioxide emissions. Trapping those emissions also helps. Some cement makers are reducing net carbon dioxide emissions through carbon capture technology using solid sorbents or by sequestering the gas directly in concrete before it sets and solidifies. A different way to tackle concrete carbon dioxide problem is to reformulate cement with similar behaving materials that inherently generate less carbon dioxide than the ones used in traditional manufacturing methods. Another option is finding material that enables manufacturers to use less of the carbon dioxide generating components. One way to lower emissions from making cement is to reduce the amount of limestone used by mixing it with cement-like material that does not emit carbon dioxide. Fly ash, the powerly byproduct of coal combustion that is typically rich in silica, alumina, and iron oxide is the key example. It's an ex inexpensive one too. When mixed with water, it forms products like cement-like properties. Clay becomes active cementous material by heating or calcining them to around 800 degrees centigrade significantly lower than the 1400 degree centigrade needed to produce ordinary cement, explains Karen Scrivener, a research group leader of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Not only does calcining clay use less carbon dioxide emitting fuel, but it also does not divide, but it also does not involve decomposing limestone, a major source of the gas in traditional cement preparation. Geopolymers are another category of low carbon dioxide emitting cements that are making a splash in the news. Semex just launched Virtua Ultra Zero, a geopolymer clinker free concrete in which an alkali activated alumina silica matrix serves as the binder, according to Semex Sampini. The material does not require high temperature processing and it reduces carbon dioxide emissions by 70% relative to traditional cement. As a civil, civil, structural, or geotechnical engineering professional, do you consider the environmental friendliness of the materials you are specifying? Initiatives like this one certainly may help more designers consider such decisions. Next up, let's look at an interesting story from the US. Charleston weighs well as seas rise and storms strengthen. From Michelle Liu, APnews.com. 
the low-lying Atlantic seaport is considering the, its most drastic measure yet to protect the lives and livelihoods of residents from the threats of climate-driven flooding, walling off its peninsula from the ocean. Some oppose walling off the city from its picturesque waterfront that helps draw millions of visitors each year. Others fear the wall will change wetlands and wildlife or that poor neighborhoods will be left out of flooding solutions. The city of 136,000 has seen higher tides and weather, more frequent rainstorms in recent years with climate change. In 2019, the downtown flooded a record 89 times according to the National Weather Service, mostly from high tides and wind pushing water inland. And the city could flood up to 180 times per year by 2045, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. There is also a threat each year that hurricane-driven storm surge could inundate the city's peninsula, which is at the confluence of three rivers and mostly less than 20 feet, 6.1 meters above sea level. Earlier this year, the Army Corps of Engineers unveiled a proposal for an eight-mile-long or 12.9-kilometer-long wall that will surround the peninsula and reach a height of 12 feet or 3.7 meters above sea level. The agency's proposal includes a floating breakwater offshore and some non-structural measures, such as raising homes not situated behind the seawall. The entire project is estimated to cost $1.75 billion. Whether the city builds a wall or not, the process has accelerated the conversation Charleston needs to have about sea level rise, said Winslow Hasty of the historic Charleston Foundation. This may be a conversation that becomes more common in coastal cities across the U.S. and beyond. Next up, U.S. news in civil engineering. First, let's hear from the majors of Houston, Texas, and Miami-Dade, Florida. A public-private partnership 2020, U.S. majors talk city, city resiliency. From Russell Hickson, Canada.ConstructionConnect.com. Building resilient cities and addressing climate change are key, said U.S. majors at the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships annual conference. In a session on city resiliency, the majors of Houston, Texas, and Miami-Dade County gave their thoughts on how best to build cities that could handle future problems. Daniela Levine Cava, the newly elected major of Miami-Dade County in Florida, gave her perspective on the direction she wants to see the area go in. They have suffered extremely during this pandemic, said Kava. She also wants to raise wages, bring down housing prices, and address the county's heavily congested transportation infrastructure. She also explains the coastal county has immense assets at risk from rising sea levels, and she intends to pursue aggressive infrastructure solutions to protect them. She said she intends to make a clean environment a major priority. Conversant and Deans also heard from Sylvester Turner, the major of Houston, Texas. Turner explained how the energy hub is shifting to address climate goals and building infrastructure that could withstand tomorrow's storms. Turner noted the city has faced six major storms in the past five years, including Hurricane Harvey, which impacted more than 300,000 buildings and structures. The city is addressing this with its recently passed climate plan. The city intends to meet Paris Accord climate goals by 2050 or sooner by working in collaboration with the Texas energy sector. The plan calls for flooding the region with clean tech companies, planting millions of trees and putting more electric vehicles on the road. Turner boasted that currently all the city's buildings are 100% run on renewable energy. It's good to hear political leaders putting an emphasis on these issues. Many times, it is their influence that can help create funding for these types of projects that we get to work on as civil engineers. Let's hope they follow through, or better yet, get involved in your community in advocacy if possible. Next up, let's head to Utah. Utah Department of Transportation considering Gondola Cog Railroad to reduce Little Cottonwood Canyon traffic. From Jed Ball, KSL. TV.com. Officials with the Utah Department of Transportation now have new transportation ideas to consider as a result of public feedback during the summer. The options will dramatically change the transportation in the canyon. On a busy winter day, more than 7,000 cars head up Little Conwood Canyon and traffic jams have become problematic and dangerous. The new ideas? A gondola heading 
from the base near the Kale restaurant and a cog railroad that will depart from the same area and head to Alta and Snowbird. The cog rail, different from the regular train, will be new to Utah. It looks much like a cog rail operating on Pikes Peak in Colorado. Each of the new alternatives, 1,000 people up the mountain during peak hours. The range in capital costs from $334 million for the enhanced bus service to $1 billion for the cog rail. Winter operating costs are somewhat similar for each of the alternatives under consideration in the range of $7 to $10 million a year. Right now, the Utah Department of Transportation is studying the environment impacts of each of the alternatives. They hope to release the draft environmental impact statement next summer, including the preferred alternative. Good to hear about some potential alternatives to reduce traffic congestion. However, as stated in the article, in addition to the initial construction costs, operating costs are also needed to be considered in deciding on projects of this magnitude. Let's move on to some international news in civil engineering from this past week. First up, we're headed to England. Deck Scraper Highways England Backs New Road Repair Method From unknown, the construction index.co.uk Highways England has approved the use of an American-made scrapping machine to remove road surface membranes instead of using standard hydraulic excavator. It has invested £650,000 in the development of this new deck scraper vehicle. The deck scraper uses a blade to shave off the asphalt membrane, making it much quieter than steel tooth excavator bucket hackling at it. Waterproof membranes are routinely used on structures such as bridges and underpasses to help protect the structure from corrosive damage caused by winter gridding operations. Highways England contributed to the cost of developing the deck scraper through its £30 million a year designated funds program, Ring Fenced for Sporting Innovation. Highways England Innovations lead for the Midlands, Lisa Marek, said, It is anticipated that thanks to the deck scraper, this method will now set the benchmark expected for membrane removal through the country. Let's take a quick break for the news for this week's civil engineering career inspiration. As an introvert, and as many engineers are introverts, we tend to think that introvert people are someone that is really quiet or that likes to be alone. But in reality, the way that our brains are, as introverts works is a little different than extroverts. And a book that I found really helpful to understand how my brain works and how to maybe recharge my energy after a long conversation or a, a conference is a book called Quiet by Susan Cain. It's a book that I've been recommending a lot to people, especially in the engineering profession where we, we are confused about our role as engineers and our capabilities as engineers to express our emotions, express our designs, talk to clients. Um, engineering is a profession that requires a lot of communication. And usually you will think as an introverted person, as someone that just wants to sit in the office and doesn't want to really share their experiences. But in reality, uh, our role as introverts and our role as engineers is, it goes way beyond that. So take that book as a recommendation. Go read it if you're an introvert and want to learn a little bit more about how your brain works. It really helped me understand how I should better approach my career and better approach conversation with new people and, and stay engaged in, in the profession. So hopefully you found that inspirational. Now let's get back into the news. Next up, we're staying in the UK. Can engineers take the lead on shaping a sustainable future? From Seth Schultz, newcivilengineer.com. It was refreshing and invigorating to see the recent address by incoming president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, also known as ICE, Rachel Skinner, providing a frank explanation of the urgent need for decarbonization and the importance for civil engineers to take a leading role. One stark fact that stands out is that they have at least 30 years of worsening climate impacts to experience even if we immediately cut carbon to levels that we're required to keep global warming in check. This lag means that extreme weather, wildfires, flooding, drought, and water stress, and all the consequent impacts of these on our infrastructure will become increasingly hazardous to humanity. 
Engineers must deliver the decarbonization we need for, for a sustainable planet and build the resilience for humanity to survive. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that over the next 15 years, around $100 trillion investment is needed to support our aging and deteriorating critical infrastructure globally. With the Institute of Civil Engineers, having joined the coalition and founding organizers, the resilient shift the William Cell Partnership Limited, the Global Covenant of Majors for Climate Change and Energy, and the American Society of Civil Engineers, a strong momentum is building. We are collaborating to empower engineers to be motivated and be able to step up and be part of the solution to build a safe, sustainable, and resilient future. It is great to see leading organizations uniting civil engineering professionals to combat climate change. On that note, let's finish up with a few infrastructure-related stories, starting with some great news about mass transit in the NYC metropolitan area. Amtrak 2020 infrastructure plan hinges on a 4.9 billion funding request from Tom Ichniowski, ENR.com. As Amtrak continues to experience major declines in ridership and revenue, it is seeking a $4.9 billion from Congress for physical 2021 for operating needs and to keep its large infrastructure and capital spending plans on schedule. Amtrak's physical 2021 infrastructure list includes spending on the planned replacement for the Portal North Bridge in Newark, New Jersey. Amtrak with New Jersey Transit hopes to start construction in calendar 2021 on the project. The plan also includes investment to advance improvements in the Hudson Tunnel between Manhattan and New Jersey. Tony Kosha, board chairman, said that ridership in 2020 was only about 25% of pre-pandemic levels. Kosha added that the company is projecting some improvement in the current physical year, but volume still will be 37% from pre-COVID figures. After Republicans and the Trump administration balked at that figure, Democratic leaders came down to about $2.2 trillion before the November 3rd elections. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin proposed $1.8 trillion, up from that earlier number. Kosha also said Amtrak had received very encouraging signs from the new administration both during the campaign and during the transition period. We don't often think about how some of these mass transit related organizations have suffered during the pandemic and the reduction in people traveling to work. Next up to Seattle. Keeping Key Arena's landmark lead overhead at Climate Pledge Arena redeveloping is a 22-ton balancing act from Nadine M. Post, ENR.com. Most contractors will jump at the chance to have a roof overhead during a major rebuild. But for the team turning earthquake-prone Seattle's 411,000 square foot of Key Arena into the 932,000 square foot Climate Pledge Arena, the city-owned facility's historic helmet has been a 44 million pound design and construction headache. The temporary support system, which also had to resist seismic loads and limit movement to one quarter of an inch, ended up costing $35 million and weighing 4,400 tons. Costs for the mind-boggling redevelopment now at $1 billion have increased by $250 million from OBU's group's early budget. The toughest part is done. There is no collision or mishaps. The roof is buried on its permanent supports and the shoring is all but removed. The job, 55% complete, is on schedule. The arena is aiming to be the first International Living Future Institute zero carbon certified professional sports venue and a model for other arenas. The project is the second reincarnation of the Seattle Center building, which built a great with a clear span pitch roof as the exhibit hall for the 1962 Seattle World's Fair. The building has been known as Key Arena since 1995, expansion to create a mostly sunken city ball. The new sports and entertainment venue with four levels below grade and two above will contain 17,400 seats for hockey and host the Seattle Kraken. It will offer 18,600 seats for basketball and will host the Women's National Basketball Association Team Seattle Storm. The arena redevelopment 
will have been nearly impossible without the help of 4D modeling, which combines a 3D model with a schedule. The team pre-built the arena virtually in the model to work out in advance as many conflicts and crashes as possible. 4D is also helping to resolve problems encountered in the field. This is an impressive project, and the Engineering Management Institute is currently seeking an interview from the project representatives for the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, which can be found at structuralengineeringchannel.com. Lastly, for this week, to the U.S. Federal Highway Administration proposes changes in design standards for highway resurfacing from Tom Ichniowski, ENR.com. The Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, has proposed a regulation that it says will give state departments of transportation more flexibility in setting design standards for resurfacing, restoration, and rehabilitation RRR, projects on existing interstate highways and other key arteries. The proposal, published in the Federal Register on November 24th, will incorporate updated design standards, principally those issued in recent years by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, also known as ASHO, and drop older versions of the benchmarks. Federal Highway Administration says in its proposal, these proposed design standards provide a range of acceptable values for highway features, allowing for flexibility that best suits the desires of the community while satisfying the purpose of the project that needs of its users. Federal Highway Administration has set a tight deadline of December 24th for receiving comments on its proposal. Administrator Nicole R. Nanson of Federal Highway Administration said in a statement that the agency proposes to provide regulatory relief to states to address the immediate repair needs of our nation's roadways without compromising safety and efficiency. The Engineering Management Institute is currently seeking an interview from an FHA representative for the Civil Engineering Podcast, which can be found at civilengineeringpodcast.com. To wrap up, here's an inspirational quote to motivate you for the rest of your day. And this quote comes from a previous episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, and, and it's from Christian Knudsen. As you enter into the profession of engineering, you are making a pact for lifelong learning and the necessity to be continuously enhancing and developing your own skills. It's a really powerful quote that it's going to motivate you and you should live by in your career. There you have it. That's what's happening this week in civil engineering. You can find references to all these stories mentioned at twice.news. And all episodes are also published in video on EMI's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash engineering careers. Remember to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever you listen to podcasts. And of course, on YouTube for the video version. This is Luis Duque signing off. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, go and be the best civil engineering you can be.